Okay, let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we come now to your word. We trust that, as it says, it's living and active and able to change us. Open our hearts to it now, we pray in Jesus' name, the living word. Amen. Well, as you heard in the video, and if you were here last week, we're in a series called Hand Me Another Brick, pun intended. It's on the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. What a remarkable story. And Pastor Brian talked about some of this last week, but in case you weren't here, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and the original Old Testament scriptures are, were one book, one story. They really tell one story. We've separated them out in our Old Testament. And along with the Old Testament book of Esther, they, they talk about one single period in Israel's history, a period of about 110 years or so. It's uh, the period immediately following what we call the Babylonian captivity or the exile. It's really the story of how God brought his people back in, in waves and restored them to Jerusalem, and his people reemerged on, on the world history's stage, as it were. In fact, without Ezra and Nehemiah and the figures in these stories, we would not know Judaism as we know it today. It'd be gone. It's really a remarkable thing that happened in history. And let me give you a little context here, uh, just so we understand. Um, the, the, those books, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, cover roughly the 6th century B.C., but for 800 years, from 1400 until 600 B.C., the, the dominant power in the world was the Assyrian Empire. You remember in the book of Jonah, God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, a very wicked nation. And for 800 years, they dominated the world, the Assyrian Empire. In 600 B.C., Babylon comes on the scene and begins to overtake Assyria. And in 605 B.C., a man named Nebuchadnezzar, um, you might know him from Rack, Shack, and Benny and VeggieTales. But anyway, he's, uh, he's the, the, the son of the original Babylonian king, and he sort of finishes what his dad started. He wipes out the few outposts of the Assyrian army, and now Babylon is the dominant power in the world. In 536 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar marches on Jerusalem and for over six months lays siege to the city. And it, the end result is that Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is burned to the ground. Everything of value is carried away out of the temple, all the sacred art artifacts and relics and portions of worship. And the city wall is destroyed, reduced to rubble. And thousands upon thousands of Jews are carried away to Babylon to live as servants, slaves, or just people in that capital city. A few Jews are left, kind of the remnant, in and around Judea in the area surrounding Jerusalem, but most are gone. So in other words, Jerusalem, and essentially this is the final stage in the demise of the Old Testament nation of Israel, as we understood it, is gone. For all intents and purposes, it's gone. The bulk of its people are carried away. The capital city, the center of its culture and worship is destroyed. This is, by the way, is told, the story told in 2 Kings 23 through 25. It's the time of Daniel and the prophet Ezekiel and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or if you're like my kids growing up, Rack, Shack, and Benny. Uh, this is their story. 50 years later then, in 539 B.C., the Persian king Cyrus the Great conquers Babylon. So we've gone from, from Assyria to Babylon, to Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire. Cyrus the Great conquers uh, the Babylonian Empire, and now the Medo-Persian or Persian Empire is the dominant power in the world. And Cyrus has a little different state policy than the Babylonians. He's more lenient and tolerant of foreign people. He allows them to have their own worship. In fact, in th just four years after he in it, it comes into his throne, he allows a man named Zerubbabel to, uh, Zerubbabel to return to Jerusalem. Zerubbabel goes back with 45,000 Jews to rebuild the temple. Now, and they take 20 years to do it. In 516 B.C., the temple's done. That story's told in Ezra chapter 2. You can read about that. But uh, the temple was a much smaller scale version of what existed under Solomon's time or what would exist under Herod the Great in Jesus' day. But it's a start. It's the first wave of return. They're beginning to worship again. But the people are still scattered, they're still distracted, they've intermarried. And by the way, when you read in the New Testament about the Samaritan issue, how Jews hate Samaritans, what's happening among the remnant, this is the beginning of all that hostility. So that, so, so Zerubbabel goes back with those people and builds the temple. Sixty years go by, and this 60 years is the time of Queen Esther. And by the way, we forget that Bible history is also world history. You know, they're not two different things. They go together. During the 60-year period, Cyrus dies, and his son Xerxes takes over. Xerxes is the king who uh, led Persia against the Greek city-states. If you've seen the movie 300 or read about the, the Battle of Thermopylae or the Peloponnesian Wars, this is that time in history. This is what's going on. Esther in the Old Testament becomes one of the queens of, of Xerxes to help bring uh, favor to God's people living in exile still. 
In 457 BC, Xerxes dies and Artaxerxes, his son, takes over. These are fun names to say. Now Artaxerxes is the king of Persia and he allows a man named Ezra to return. Zerubbabel's already there, built the temple. Now Ezra goes back, and Ezra doesn't build anything physically, but Ezra does something remarkable. He goes back and he institutes remarkable social, moral, and religious reforms. You know how he does it? He reads and he teaches God's word, which the people haven't heard in over a generation. He brings back the law, the word of God, and the people begin to change. And he goes back about 1,500 Jews. But Ezra is not permitted to build the city walls. You, Pastor Brian talked to you last, year, last week about the significance of ancient walls in a city. Because you can have a temple in worship. You can read your own sacred books, that's fine. But if you start to build the wall, now you're a political and military threat. So that doesn't happen until 444 B.C., 13 years after Ezra and over 100 years after the first Babylonian captivity. Artaxerxes allows a man named Nehemiah to go back and to rebuild the wall. That's the story we're looking at. That's the third wave of return. So in just over 100 years' time, a lot has happened, is happening in God's people, Israel. Now, Nehemiah lived his whole life in, he was born under Babylonian rule, and he lived his, most of his life under Persian rule. He is a Jew by birth and culture, but he's also grown up in the culture of Babylon and the Persian Empire. He's never been, it's very unlikely he would have ever seen Jerusalem. It's not his world. It's not, how, it's not the world he's grown up in. And he's living, and his role is cupbearer to the king. I know Brian talked about this last week, but in brief, his job was to select, test, and serve any drink, especially wine, served in the palace throne room. He himself had to drink any wine served to the king directly. He would have had a staff to do this. He had direct access to the most powerful man in the world on a daily basis. Much more than a glorified servant, this guy would have been a trusted advisor. And he risen to that position because of his character and his skill and the kind of man that he was. All right, let's begin the story. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Pastor Brian preached on this last week, but I want to use it as the setup to the rest of the chapter, which is Nehemiah's prayer, which is what we're going to be talking about. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. Verse 4. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. We'll stop there for a minute. I want to look at verse 4. Nehemiah's first response to this news about God's people, the, the, the terrible state they're in in Jerusalem, is to weep. We're going to talk about his prayer, but first we have to see that Nehemiah's prayer is a, begins as a prayer of tears. The prayer of tears. Knowing in general about a need or an issue is not at all the same thing as being deeply moved personally by it. You read about and you hear about the tragic death of a child in the news. And it's, you, for a moment, we think how awful, how terrible. But we quickly move on to our lives, right? At least I do. Pastor Brian was with a family yesterday who lost their son, their four-year-old child, drowning in a pool. He's with them in Delnor on, as an on-call chaplain. Some of you might have read about that in the paper. It's different than sitting with the family and hearing their cries of grief over the loss of their child. Nehemiah is moved to tears over what he hears. I mean, I remember years ago when we went to the south side of Chicago to the Roseland community when I was leading a group of students there in service. We were sleeping in the church and working in the community uh, during the day, and the first morning we got up, I heard adult voices, and I was nervous because we're supposed to be the only ones in the church. I went down to the sanctuary, and this group of about 10 or 12 African-American men and the, and the pastor, Reverend Tony, are praying, and they're reading actually from Nehemiah, and they're praying in the church. So I snuck in and sat and listened. Some of the men were weeping, weeping over children they knew who'd been shot in gang-related violence, over families who had lost children. And they were reading the scripture and praying, and when they were done, I asked Reverend Tony, do you do that every week? He said, oh, no, brother, every day. Every day we pray for God's kingdom to come here in this community. It really struck me. And then he said something to me I've never forgotten related to Nehemiah 1, verse 4. He said, you have to weep before you can build. It's a great statement, and it's true. 
God wants to use people, at first he wants to break them, to burden them, to bring them to tears, to break their heart for what breaks his. That's what's happening to Nehemiah here. I don't know about you, but sometimes the, just you turn on the television, cable news, you, you, you watch the news feeds on your phone or on the internet, or you just read the paper, and there's just so many tragic stories, so many stories of corruption and sadness and pain that you kind of build a wall, right? You kind of you think, oh, how, tra- how bad, how awful, how tragic, somebody should do something. But we move on because you kind of have to become callous to it. I think for Nehemiah, living in uh, the, the, the palace, eating the best food, wearing the best clothes, living this very, I mean, he'd risen about as high as you can go as an exile under foreign rule. I sometimes wonder if his security and comfort of his own life made it even harder for him to hear about the plight of, of God's people. How can I stay comfortable here? It reminds me of Jesus' words in Matthew 9, when he looks out not at an individual need, but on the masses. And he, Matthew tells us that he saw the crowds and he was moved with compassion because they were to him like sheep without a shepherd. And then Jesus said, therefore get on your knees and pray to the Lord of the harvest to send his workers into the field, for the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Nehemiah prays a prayer of tears because he's broken over what breaks God's heart. I think that's the starting point for being used by God. Second thing I want you to notice about Nehemiah's prayer is that it's a prayer of patience. Now, you'll have to look at two different chapters here. In the first chapter, the words of Nehemiah, this comes to him, we're told, in the month of Kislev. That's a Hebrew word, which actually means darkness. And it's, um, it refers to, in the, our calendar, late November, early December. That's Kislev. In chapter 2, verse 1, the month of Nisan. Not Nissan, the car manufacturer, but Nisan. Nisan, in the Hebrew calendar, correlates to late April, early May in our calendar. So that's four and a half to five months of time between when Nehemiah hears about the need of God's people and when he actually does something about the need, going to the king. Here's a question then. What is Nehemiah doing for four and a half to five months? What's he doing all that time? He's praying. You know, it's very easy to read this and think, Nehemiah heard bad news, he cried, he fasted, he prayed a great prayer, and he got busy with his plan. Let's go do something. That's not how it happens. For four and a half, no, what we have here in 5 through 11 is not a one-time prayer of Nehemiah. It's a pattern of his prayer life for the next four to five months. He says in, in, in verse 4, I wept and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before God. For four and a half months or more, Nehemiah is weeping. He's fasting. He's praying. He's seeking God. How quickly we want to jump right to our plans. I don't know about you, but I don't pray that way. I mean, I hear about a need and I think we should pray, but then let's get busy. Let's do something, right? We've got something to do. Martin Luther once famously said, I have so much to do that if I don't spend the first six hours in prayer, I'll never get it all done. We chuckle because that's not how we think, is it? We think I'm too busy to pray. I've got stuff to do. I'll pray later. Or in a lot of church circles, we we think of prayer as like a a way you begin and end a meeting, right? Pray at the beginning, pray at the end, and that sort of gives God's, uh, like he'll, it's like therefore God has to bless our ideas. Or, Or we say, I'll pray for you, which sometimes, if we're not careful, is the Christian way of saying, see you later. Ending a conversation. I'll pray for you. I have to go now, right? Nehemiah sees it different. Spends four months seeking God. Martin Luther also famously said, prayer does not prepare us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. I confess to you that I think I'm just learning that. I don't don't think of it that way. Prayer is not preparing us for something. Prayer is the something we're called to do. I think Nehemiah gets that. I I think what's happening for Nehemiah is he knows in his heart, this is so big. That it's not going to be my leadership, my wisdom, my skill, my experience in the palace, my natural charisma in motivating people, or or any of that that's going to get this done. Of course, God will use Nehemiah and who he is. But Nehemiah knows in his heart, for this to happen, it has to be an act of God. It has to be an act of God. I cannot do this without him. That's why he's seeking him. Friends, the most powerful resource we have as Christians is not our collective wisdom. It's not our political vote. It's not our ingenuity or our intelligence or our ideas or our programs or our budgets. It's our God. 
And I think we are all very guilty of running past right to what we can do, what we can accomplish. The best thing any of us can do is to seek God about whatever we're facing. I believe that God wants to change the world through the prayer of his people. But how many of us are patient enough to pray enough to have our wills aligned with his will, that we see the world the way he sees it? So Nehemiah prays a prayer of tears and a prayer of patience. Sometimes I think when I, it feels like I'm wasting time, you know, to spend too much time in prayer. Uh, If that's you, if you ever feel that way, let me just encourage you. When you seek God in prayer, you're not wasting time. You're doing the best thing you can do. Third, we see Nehemiah's prayer is a prayer of confession. Let's read the prayer and we'll talk about this part. Verse 5. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word you commanded to your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. That, as I said, is a pattern of his prayer life for four months, but there's a lot in this prayer for us. Notice the confession. In verses 5 through 7, Nehemiah confesses the sins of the people. Now, there's, I think, three layers of confession going on here. The first layer is this. Nehemiah is confessing the sins of the Israelites a hundred years earlier, and earlier than that, that got them into this predicament in the first place. Go back and read Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 45 when God and and other prophets, when God says, look, if you continue to rebel and disobey and live this way, it's going to go bad for you and I'm going to give you over to these other pagan nations. And so Nehemiah is saying, God, it's not your fault, it's ours. We're, We're the ones, your people are the ones who messed this whole deal up in the first place. It's our fault that we're in this situation. Second, he's praying a prayer of confession for the present sins of the remnant living in Israel. In, in, in and around Jerusalem. Those people had intermarried with foreign nations. They had, were not worshiping God or following his law. They were scattered and they were distracted and they were immoral. And Nehemiah is saying, it's not only our, the fault of our ancestors, it's the fault of the, your people right now that we're in this situation. But the third is the most remarkable confession. Notice that Nehemiah says, even I and my father's house. He identifies himself with the sins of these people. I think this is a prayer that none of us would think to pray. Remember, Nehemiah has never been to Jerusalem. He was born in Babylon, raised in Persia. These are not, he's not, doesn't know these people. They're they're, they're stories he's heard. It's been over a hundred years. I mean, I think the natural human reaction for you and for me, or anybody in that situation is to go, look, that's terrible. I feel bad about it. It's very tragic, but it's not my fault. I mean, I wasn't even born. I don't live there. I'm not a part of this. I live over here. I feel bad, but it's not me. That's how most of us react. It's not how Nehemiah reacts. How is it that he can say, I've done it. I'm right with them. Well, first of all, Israel, the Old Testament, relied upon a deeply shared national identity as God's chosen people. A communal sense of, we are the people of God. He called us, the children of Israel, out to be his people. He blessed us with the giving of his law at Mount Sinai. He rescued us out of slavery in Egypt. There was this deeply shared identity as God's people. I think we totally lost that in the church today. Don't you? We're so individual, our culture is so individualized and we're so fractured. We come to church thinking about what we get. Does it mean our, and we associate with other Christians based on, uh, do I like them? They meet my needs. That's how we're conditioned to think. But if you think about it, the church is not a replacement of Israel. It's a continuation of it. We are God's people in the world. 
We ha should have the ultimate shared identity. Those who have been brought from darkness to light, Paul says, redeemed by the blood of Christ, the New Testament tells us. Forgiven of our sin, we are the body of Christ on earth. We should have the ultimate shared identity. We are not individuals. We're part of a family. Let me put a finer point on it for you. When you watch the news or you read the news on, 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 on your phone or whatever and you hear about some Christian leader of a church, of a denomination, or of a, 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 non, a non-profit organization, somebody who claims to be a Christian, and it's in the news that they've done something terrible, cheated on their spouse, embezzled money, just committed a terrible sin, and embarrassed the name of Christ and the Christian community. Or, or when you see on maybe a news network, when they put somebody up there who's supposed to represent evangelical Christianity, and they're a whack job, you know what I'm talking about? They, they, the way they talk is like, oh man, that's not how I think. That person's crazy, they're way off the reservation. What's your first reaction when you hear about that kind of thing? Is it anger? How could they do that? Is it repulsion? Like, oh, I don't want to be associated with them. Or, or do you, like me, sometimes want to distance yourself immediately from them? Well, that's not my church. That's not how we are. That's not what I do. I think those are all very natural, and I have all those reactions. How many of us ever feel deep sorrow for that person? How lost and broken they are. How many of us ever pray for that person? How many of us ever identify and think, you know what, the seeds of that heinous offense are in me too? I don't very often think that way. That's what Nehemiah does here. It's really remarkable. He has every reason to say, that's not my deal. He says, I'm, I'm right with them. Those are my people. It breaks my heart. He's not just praying for their restoration, he's praying for his own. It's a prayer of confession. A prayer of tears, a prayer of patience, a prayer of confession. Next we see it's a prayer of presence. A prayer for God's... Look at, look at verse 8. Verse 8 of chapter 1. Nehemiah says, remember the word you commanded your servants. That word remember. By the way, when you read the Old Testament, God is over and over and over again saying, remember. To, he's telling us to remember. Remember what I did. Remember what I said. Remember who I am. You're forgetful people. Don't forget. Remember me. Right? Here, Nehemiah is telling God to remember. Why is he doing that? Does he really think God forgot what he said? God, don't forget what you told, what you said. Is he like, kind of like, you know, like my kids when they were little? Not so much now when they were younger. They, they would always want to get mommy and me to promise. Do you promise? Like, let's stop for ice cream. You promise? You promise? We'll see if there's time. Do you promise? Do you promise? Because in Noah's little mind, if dad's promised, that was like an ironclad guarantee, nothing could break it. We're stopping for ice cream, Right? So we, tried, we learned early on, well, we'll see if there's time. We, we, might, we might, you know, we would hedge. I remember one time when I promised and we didn't stop, you thought his, his whole worldview was collapsing in on him. You promised, you know. <laughs> Why is Nehemiah saying, remember, God? Nehemiah is teaching us something very important about prayer. The only basis he has, and we have, for approaching God is in the character and nature of God, not ourselves. The only basis on which Nehemiah can approach God is God's faithfulness, not his. He's saying, in effect, God, I'm counting on you to be you. I'm counting on you to be true to your word. The only hope I have is that you'll be faithful to your promise. And by the way, when we pray, it's the same basis. The cross, we're told, all God's promises are yes and amen in Jesus. The cross is our assurance that God is faithful and just and hears us and answers. I think many people, even in the church, the basis of our prayer life is our own need, not God's faithfulness. You know what I mean? I, I, we, it's not wrong to come to God with our needs. Paul says in Philippians 4, by everything in prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. That's good and right, and we should do that. However, I'm guessing many of you, if you pray, and I hope you do, you have a prayer list, right? Things you should pray for. Things people have asked you to pray for. Things you want to pray for. Things you feel you're obligated to pray for. And so you pray through your list. And that's the basis of your appeal. Your own desperation. Your own list. Your own need. How, how often... Do you set the list aside and just seek God? Not for any answers on the list, but just for him. Just for his presence. Just to have more of him in your life. I confess to you, it's not often enough for me. 
I think what Nehemiah is saying here, do you, do you notice that in this prayer, he never once mentions stones, bricks, mortar, wood, work teams, budgets, calendars, plans. He doesn't mention any. There's a lot of stuff to pray for. He doesn't mention any of it. He doesn't even mention a wall. Now, we get to the specifics much later in the next couple chapters, but it never comes up. Why? Because I think Nehemiah knows beyond all that stuff, what he needs most is the presence of God. Like Moses in Exodus 33, when he realizes he's going to have to lead God's people, and he says, God, if your spirit doesn't go with us, I don't want to go. Don't send us unless you're going to go with us. I don't know about you, but I'm convicted by this. I've got my list. My kids are on it. My wife is on it. My, our church is on it. My own stuff in my own life is on it. And it's not wrong to have a list. But do you want God? Or do you just want you think what you hope God can give you? I think the best thing any of us could pray for is more of God in our lives, more of God in our church, more of God. Not what we think we need. In fact, I, I was at a prayer, a prayer conference in the south side of Chicago a few weeks ago in the, in the Englewood neighborhood. You probably read about Englewood. It's a rough place. And this was a prayer meeting taking place. And there was some men from Africa that were teaching about revival and things that they had experienced in Uganda. And there was some remarkable teaching going on. But they spent a lot of time in prayer. And now Englewood has political corruption, gang violence, drug addiction, uh, sy systemic poverty, terrible schools. They've got a lot of things to pray for. They didn't bring up one of them. For a couple of hours, they just prayed for God. It was as if they knew, God, if you come, if we have more of you, then this stuff will begin to happen. But what we want more than any of this stuff is you. Nehemiah prays for God's presence. And last, Nehemiah prays for God's purpose, a prayer of purpose. What is God's purpose? Notice Nehemiah doesn't talk about the wall. He doesn't talk about his plans. Nehemiah prays for God's purpose. What's God's purpose? What's the ultimate end here? It's not the wall. The wall is, 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 is a, it's really an afterthought. It's part of a representation of God's purpose. What's God's purpose in God's plan? In fact, let's make it broader. What's God's purpose in the church? What are we, what are we doing when we come here on Sunday morning and you show up and you sit and you stand when we tell you to stand and sit, we tell you, you turn and greet each other and you go home and you feel good about yourselves and you come back on whatever day it is to serve and we're doing this thing we call church. What's God's purpose? What's God's purpose in redeeming people, saving them from all parts of the world? What, what is God up to? Well, clearly, it's to make you happier, healthier, a little more financially secure and stable and feel better about your own lives. That's what God wants. Do you feel that way? I hope you do. Amen. Let's go. Right. You know, you're going to hear that. Turn on the television, flip on lots of channels. That's what you hear. That's what God wants. That's what he's after. This might come as a shock to some of you, but I can tell you on the authority of God's word, God's primary agenda in the world is not, has never been, and will never be your happiness. Now, that does not mean he's not out to make you miserable. But God's primary agenda is not you and your ha or me. It's his, it's his own glory. What God is after is his glory. Now, that sounds weird to us because if any human being lived for their own glory, it would be twisted. If I lived for my own glory, it would be out of whack. I would be horribly arrogant and off track. And we've seen that throughout human history. But we're talking about the God of the universe, the Holy One of Israel, the High King of Heaven, the only being in the universe for whom that makes perfect sense, that he would exist for his own glory. This is what, in verse 9, when he says, quoting Isaiah, to bring them back to the place I have chosen to make my name dwell there. If you like to highlight or underline, underline that phrase, make my name dwell there. That's a Hebrew euphemism for the glory of God. What Nehemiah is really about and what the church is supposed to be about is not the wall, not the hole in the ground, not VBS programs. All those things are ancillary to the glory of God. That's what we're supposed to be about. A place where the name of God dwells. And the world sees it and can't deny it, where the power of God resides, where families are restored, where, where sin is forgiven, where addictions are, are, where people are set free from those things, where marriages are reconciled, where undeniable, remarkable things are happening and God gets the glory. That's, that's the church. That's what Nehemiah wants, not to build a wall. That's just part of it. But to see God's people return and his glory return John Piper wrote a book called God's Passion for His Glory. It's really a commentary on a, on a sermon given by Jonathan Edwards called The End for Which God Made the World. 
It's, it's, it'd be some not so light summer reading for you if you want to pick it up. I would encourage you to do so. But he's right. And the church in history where we get off track is when we start living for our glory, our little kingdom. There's a lot of kingdom building going on in the church today, isn't there? Publishing industries and, and, and online and virtual and mega church kingdoms. Nothing wrong with a large church. We are one. But it's for the glory of God. Not for ours. Not for our comfort or our security. And here's the beautiful irony. God knows that when we exist for his glory, not for our own, the beautiful irony is we get fulfillment and joy that's far greater than circumstantial happiness. He wants what's best for you, which is to live your life for his glory. That's ultimately what Nehemiah is praying for and what this story is about. Let's pray. God, we thank you and we worship you and praise you for this amazing text. We confess to you that we are short-sighted, fearful, and forgetful people. And we so easily lose sight of who you are and what you've called us to be a part of. Thank you for this church. Grant us your spirit that we might get it right. We exist for your glory. We worship you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.